Hello, and welcome back, perhaps, to uh, D-Web Decoded, our ongoing podcast, although it's not really a podcast because we're on video and, like, I don't know, that always jars for me. Um, uh, this time we're joined by one of the uh, pillars, it always sounds bad to say veterans because that has both an implication of being too old and also being in some <laughs> sort of, like, violent confrontation, but Kalani, you have been... Uh, let me read the bio and then and then we'll get into like your your viewpoint so my eyes will turn over as I read the, the words. Klani Nicole is a technologist and founder of an experimental media art gallery called Transfer uh, in Brooklyn, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, she has been exploring decentralized networks and virtual worlds in contemporary art since 2013. Uh, currently, she is building the Transfer Data Trust, which I'm looking forward to talking about, a decentralized data trust and cooperative model for cultural value exchange and producing a generative documentary film almost in real time. Uh, Kalani, thanks for, for, for joining us. Um, I'm super excited to talk about a bunch of your stuff. Thanks so much for having me. No problem. So, okay. So just to start, it, it, like I always kind of end up going through this sort of historical <laughs> kind of thing that gets a bit like, that's life. No, uh, what's it called? Red book. Uh, this is your life. Mm -hmm. So says here, 2013, I feel like you've been involved in digital art. Like that was a key moment in it, but you've been pursuing that for, for longer. Is that, is that right? I started my gallery in 2013, but had been a student of mentors who have been working for decades in um, experimental media art space. This history goes back really to the 1970s, to the experiments in art and technology, and before that, uh, by many accounts as well. So um, I'm working in a long history um, of experimentation in my practice. But the doors opened at Transfer in 2013. And that very first year, uh, because the artists are so prescient, they see the future coming. I was reading Satoshi's white paper and selling art in Bitcoin uh, that first year of the gallery. So uh, it was right, you had a that, You had a Mt. Gox button, right? We like did, one yeah. Of we, like had the... a Mt. Gox, we had a Mt. Gox button on the website. I, I had the button embedded, and we were selling these editions um, for two Bitcoin which at the time was about $200. So yeah. I, uh, I bought soap with my early Bitcoin. I have like somewhere <laughs> I have like a Bitcoin soap, which has like the little logo in it. It's probably, probably not the best investment that I made, but um, so, uh, so 2013, so there was an aspect of this that was crypto and sort of prescient crypto before the big kind of boom, but you had this, and there's a reason for this context, viewers, just not like going 15, a long time ago, right? Mm -hmm. um, in that that was embedded both in kind of ideas of decentralized or um, a networked art, and also kind of in, again, storage tradition of virtual worlds, right, environments. Um and I think it's always interesting to to dig around, like, which bits do you feel like the recent um, Dilly Departed uh, NFT crypto art boom kind of picked up some of those elements? And which are the things that you feel sort of like are artistically kind of lying fallow at the moment for people to kind of rediscover? Yeah, what a great question. Thank you for that. Leturbo Avedon is the artist that really brought these ideas into the fold for transfer. We did that early show with the artist. They're a virtual artist, so they only exist in online spaces. And their practice is performative in the metaverse. And metaverse is quite expansive in the way that Leturbo thinks about it. Any game environment, right. even at the time, Facebook, uh, private right. groups on Facebook were a sort of very intimate online exchange. That it's sort of cyberspace writ large kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, exactly, right, right. exactly. So the poetics of the metaverse are something that that practice is really centered around. Um, and that artist anticipated NFTs in this very first solo show I did with them. Uh, we were looking at how to um, talk about speculative value of ephemeral artworks, how to talk about 
um, trade and talk Copying. about anonymity and mm-hmm. yeah, exactly. The works were meant to proliferate online, but only one person could own them. So a lot of these ideals, I think, became sort of swept up in the NFT craze. Uh, but what wasn't there was criticality and <laughs> any oh. sort of a deep conversation about value and speculation. And so I think post, you know, post the boom of NFTs, there is now this really open nascent space to get back to some of the really interesting conceptual ideas that underlie these movements. So it's so there's an interesting for me. So the, 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 this um, uh, uh, vodcast, I'm going to call it now, um, <laughs> is sort of we spend a lot of time agonizing and thinking about the decentralized nature of things. Like, what does it mean? Like, is there any like huge advantage socially or technically to this? Um, if there is, how do we how do we pull people in? How do we how do we improve it and so forth? And like, so back in twenty thirteen, um, you know, a lot of these a lot of the these explorations were going on in systems that were just naturally centralized. So Second Life, for instance, right. which was. Uh, remember that? So I'm so glad second, you brought it up. That's one of the um, that's the yeah. world where Laturbo's solo show happened in Second well, Life. Well, so, I kind yeah. of was like, I was like, <laughs> are we even are we going to mention it? Because like, if you mention it, then you have to go. A long time ago, there was mm-hmm. a man, and he made a, you know. Um, but Second Life was interesting because it was sort of a via a, a, a virtual world space that was sufficiently in the current day, right, the contemporary world, so that there was entrance for artists, there was like a general user base. It was um, a sandbox, as it were. So there wasn't the gaming element. It wasn't, like you say, most other art and things were people, you know, it was like Minecraft, people going, hey, I can do art, like stop shooting at me. Um, And also... There was a real estate boom, right? There was an NFT boom where artists and others were selling their wares. And the two questions that came up, um, I'm sorry, I'm talking too much, but but the two questions, we'll get to it. The two questions that came up were one, um, you know, what does it mean if I own this art, right? Because someone else can just can just rip it and make a perfect copy of, um, of, you know, my Godzilla costume or something. And the second was, is do I actually own anything? Right. Because actually this is run by a company, Linden labs who could right. just one day shut the whole thing down or move all the numbers around. Um, and I feel like part of that criticality that you're talking about is we've sort of, the technology is aimed at solving that second problem, right? There is no Linden Labs, right? That's sort of, right? That's what we're going for um, uh, with with sort of a post-Satoshi kind of world. Mm-hmm. The other bit, though, like, does, you know, I need a question at the end of this, right? Um, uh, do you... In your path in the last sort of 10 to 13 years of doing this, like, have you come to any like really strong conclusions about what makes um, value in, in, in art? <laughs> Such a big question. Be, help me here. Like, where are we going with this? Uh, I, I love this. I love this riff also because um, I'm really grateful to have been in conversation with Phil Brosdale and have heard a lot of the stories about Second Life and his intent and what a benevolent creator if all of Web 2.0 had been created uh, with intentions such as Phillips, we would live in a much better world. Um, but <laughs> unfortunately, he's a rare bird. Um, right. And uh, I do want to reference, I'm going to do a quick plug right now. We just did a bit of a um, live cast it was two hours and it was a session where we brought together conservators of time-based media art with technologists like Philip Rosedale. So he joined right. um, and you can find it on fora.media. That's F O R A dot media. Um, and in that conversation, I think what really emerged is a discussion of value as cultural value 
And what's embedded in that is time. So while there were certainly things, and Philip talked about this, that were um, limiting around the ideas of property ownership and the centralization of that platform, actually, it's also been something that resulted in longevity of that community and the fact that Second Life is still an incredible place inhabited by all sorts of weird stuff. And, you know, for example, the, the, the corporate position was always to preserve artwork over software improvements. And so they made a lot of really important conceptual decisions, which over the span of so many years, we can now start to see the cultural value of that accruing. So I think there's really something important about time when we talk about value. Um, there's obviously like hegemony and ownership and centralization as well to contend with. But I think uh, a much more dangerous thing we've seen emerge is the rise of speculative value and shilling as value and the loudest voice in the room is value and how different that is from the meaning that's created when humans interact over long periods of time to build culture together. Do you think that's an artifact of, of timescales itself though? Yeah. Like, I and mean, accelerationism, what? tech accelerationism, right? Like oh, yeah? scale and, and re- rapid rate of change and the emergence of AI. These are all sort of our contemporary condition. So of course right. a new movement would also have those same affordances. Right. 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 So I, I, I always, again, like with, with second life, I've, this is general. So I think this is one of the general boons of decentralized systems, which are not unique to decentralized systems, but kind of gives them something, gives them some persistence. Right. So, you know, you compare, um, second life, which was kind of engineered to be as open as it could get, but still, you know, turn a profit, keep the the servers open. Um, so it persists in the same way as say Usenet, right? So Usenet, if you didn't know second life, you're not going to know about Usenet. (laughs) So, uh, Usenet is, was one of the early, uh, sort of internet wide discussion forums. Um, you know, it died, for, as far as most people were concerned, um, when people moved to web forums uh, and so forth, but it still exists because it's decentralized, right? You can't kill the thing, um, and that and art embedded in those systems has an for me has an opportunity to persist long enough to get that Absolutely. kind of value, right? Um, can you still recreate the? Uh, I mean, could you re-exhibit the art that you were showing in 2013? Is that still possible for you? That was the topic of this consortium. Oh, sorry, and okay. and the answer is yes, but it's complicated and it requires engineering and it mm-hmm. requires interdisciplinary approach and it requires documenting the artist's intent and documenting the cultural, um, the sort of social environments around the software at the time when the art was made, because we live in a very different internet now, in a very, very different internet now. So it's it's a, a sort of sociological and also curatorial and also technical conversation to think about preserving that kind of online, live social artwork. So are you... Again, I feel so crass because, like, this is the first time I've thought about these things. But as a curator of digital art, when you, you know, want to do a retrospective, um, are you sitting there going, how do I create that moment? So something comes in and they see Second Life for the first time and they're like, holy cow, like they have little names of everybody on their heads. Um, Are you seeking to recreate what that looked like? Are you seeking to create kind of what it felt like? Um, is that is that kind of your job to 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 kind of just make that decision? And is that something that um, uh, being essentially a curator of digital art over the long term is somewhere where people are coming to conclusions, or it's everybody shooting off in different directions? It wouldn't just be me. It would also be the conservator and researchers um, and other specialists who understood the environments and the communities around those 
worlds. Uh, a really great example, um, a collaborator of mine, Regina Harsani, she's just opened a show last night at the Museum of the Moving Image in New York City with an artist called Araya Harvey, who has been making video games online since the 90s. And the level of detail and care that she worked with to go through the process of what's called emulation to right. recreate these environments and bring them into contemporary operating systems, but then also encase them in hardware environments within the museum that are reminiscent of the times in which they were encountered. There are so many layers that you can get into as a curator and working with conservators, but what it really comes down to is the artist's intent and how they want the work to be experienced and sort of how central to the art were it conceptual or not, um, that those affordances were really part of the experience. Um, so it's a, so, it's a whole rich practice yeah. and there are many, many specialists that, um, are well advanced in this, in this work. And some, some institutions do this work, but a lot of these folks are independent curators or independent researchers, um, working with the history of, of recent media art. So I'm going to give a framing thing for, I don't know how many people watch this podcast like linearly, um, but uh, I think like there are some topics that, that, that we can delve into, but the three I want to point out, right, is stuff that we've been talking about now, which is, uh, which we'll talk a bit about the Transfer Data Trust, which is a project that we're working the Falcoin Extended Cinematic Universe is working with you um, and your your uh, your colleagues on that. Um, uh, we should talk about some art that's coming up, so that will happen soon. Um, and also uh, a, a course that we're um, the, the FFDW we're helping support with Gray Area um, uh, that is coming up pretty soon. I only say this just because I suddenly realized we're going to go into a big, I am taking you on a big sprawling conversation and I wanted to make sure that like people who are like, I'm sort of interested in this, but I'm interested in some stuff that's coming up. So let's delve into the thing where I thought we were going, uh, uh, re really, really powerfully because a bunch of the people who watch this are interested or kind of their job, right. Is, is storing data for the long term, right? A lot of people in Filecoin IPFS world think about that. And we think about it often in terms of, you know, bits and bytes, right? Like, um, but we're also, if we, an, an art is clearly one of those things to preserve, right? That's, that's one of those, the world's most important information, right? Um, but as you, you, you completely convey, you know, art, is not a dead thing that you sit there and you look at its corpse, you know, when you want to engage with it, you have to, um, at the very least clumsily reanimate it in some way. Right. Um, so, uh, uh, so tell, tell us a little bit about the transfer data trust and then we'll talk just about like the permanence part of it. And then that's, then I will sprawl out. Yeah. Permanence and performance. I think they're both crucial parts of what this is about. And, you know, the observation of the data trust is that media art has to be performed. It has to be updated. It has to be brought currently into our moment. And that includes all sorts of context and care and transactions of care and research and spe uh, specialists expertise. Uh, so the data trust is meant to hold works in perpetuity, but not just hold them and let them sit there, hold them and perform them and care for them and tend to them together and do that cooperatively. So yes, obviously, all of the things about Filecoin and redundancy and decentralized storage. So the backbone of this thing is um, nodes inside the artist studio. So there is a physical copy in the glam world. We are still very much about at least three copies in three locations. We glam can massively is galleries. Galleries, Lime. libraries, archivists, and museums, not the 1970s. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. Um, so, so those decentralized nodes are also a gallery saying, okay, I am no longer the source, the centralized source of this archive. The archive remains in the artist's studio. It's no longer an extractive oh. act of archiving, right? The archive is there in the studio. It's massively decentralized. We're redundantly storing each other's works. Also, we are placing it in the Filecoin ecosystem for even more redundancy and longer timescales of thinking. And 
On top of all of that, we have a governance layer. And so this is really the speculative part because we know the Filecoin virtual machine is sort of emerging right now. And so my hypothesis is that we can encode transactions of care. These are not financial transactions. These are, I'm going to do this, you're going to do that. I'm going to give this in return, you'll get that. So we're talking about reciprocity. We're talking about meaning. We're talking about value. And I believe we can encode those things into smart contracts in this ecosystem because it all comes back to making sure that data lasts forever. Right. Right. But maybe in a more expansive way than just the bits and bytes, also the context and the care and the performance. So when I'm gone, when all the artists who are maintaining these nodes are gone, we still need human actors to be able to come in and perform these acts of care with the data. So those are the things I'm really interested now in looking at automating. And then there is, of course, the question of value. And the art world is so unique because I think we were one of the only industries where there's a well-tested system of assigning financial value to data. And so the process of appraisal, right? There's third-party appraisers in the contemporary art world. Many of those appraisers now are specialized in time-based media art, which has been trading for decades in the what does art time market. Ba- time-based media art, what does... you? Uh, what is that? That that's that, that that's a term category? I prefer to digital art because I think it's much more descriptive. Um, but it is any sort of media based artwork that exists through time. So even a static image, if you open a file, there's a moment there where you're interacting and performing the artwork. And so, so in my limited knowledge, one of the things that um, I, I I I recognize in the digital art world is one of those roots that you were talking about is in uh, video performance art, right? Video yes. art. Yes. Um, exactly. So that falls under that category, yes, right? Exactly. Is that kind of okay? And okay. and now net I art and video games and virtual worlds and even JPEGs, any sort of. Um, uh, Digital media based artwork right. would so, fall into time based media art. Yes. So I guess um, I guess I'm sorry we're, we're derailing a little bit, but but so I'm trying to get this in my head, right? It's because I often often one of the challenges with this idea and putting into a kind of a wearing a computer science hat on it is you suddenly go, okay, there's the data. The data is frozen but then we have processes right we have we have processing on it and the processing on it is the thing that's extended through time right because and that's where the value is yeah right 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 this is the way i always used to describe this is when people were like worrying i was in this weird moment right the beginning of the the, all of this where i worked in a magazines Mm -hmm. and there was this point where magazines um, would put CDs on the front of their, their, um, their, their, uh, their, you know, it's like this strata of slowly going out of date, like mediums. <laughs> it's like, okay, we'll take the paper and then we'll put a CD. But the thing that, that really broke people's heads in the publishing industry is like the magazine took this much to make because you had to do 30 pages or whatever of color. This thing was huge, right? There was so much data and executables and things like that on top of it. And they were suddenly like, are we writing a magazine with a CD on top? Or are we doing a CD with a magazine underneath, right? And that was, it was the same thing. It was the kind of, well, the value here is something that takes time, in people's lives right and like maybe if we put a game on the cd they're going to play it for like six months and if we an article they're going to read it you know once or twice Mm -hmm. right and and that's that's where the the that that's where you sort of calibrate it um sorry i derailed you we were talking about time-based media and then you were gonna say something else but maybe we Just the idea of that value being something that, you know, I think artists right now and a lot of us think about our data as just sitting there, right? It's just sitting there on files. It's not actualized. It's not sort of valued or held in any way where we can think about its value. Um, And so this project is about a conceptual shift where an artist can see the hard drives in boxes as their equity and their IP and their value aside from 
NFTs going to the moon or whatever speculative system of value have emerged around media art, I think there's a real opportunity for us to articulate the art historical value of this art. And it's, it's really essential right now. And, and I feel an urgency about it because this stuff is going into obsolescence so quickly, just as your magazine with its CD on top of it. And (laughs) it needs to be performed. It needs to be rescued before we get too far away. While these artists are here with us, while we can still have near affordances of some of the hardware that it was, that it was experienced on things like this. So um, I think there's a real cultural opportunity for us to take ownership of these processes because Unfortunately, the institutions are are a little too, uh, not a little too, they're way too slow to adopt to these kinds of practices and changes right. that are coming. Um, right. So I, 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 going back to this sort of like, is the value in the uniqueness of the art kind of the, you know, the single copy idea, the, the tension has always been for me look, you can't just have one copy because that just makes it such a fragile thing. And maybe there's some value in fragility, but like if we're trying to also preserve these things, you know, lots of copies keep stuff safe. They do. Um, And, uh, and so I love the, I I hadn't realized that with, so the bit I knew of the transfer data trust is the stuff that again, in the Falcon extended cinematic universe, we think about a lot, which is like, how do you Mm -hmm. pay forward to yes. preserve data like we can make things more robust in a decentralized way so that if one element goes bust or whatever um the data remains but the, we need more and more copies right we need to and we need to normalize that we need to legalize that um and uh and we need people to realize that just because a hundred people have a copy of your artwork like that should not reduce the value of it. In fact, it oh, should it increase the value, it. right? It does. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, there was always this fascinating tension, and I think in the NFT w- moment where people were going, yeah, but you can control right click, and there was this amazing kind of fraction in the NFT community where they were going, don't do that, that's bad, and other people going, no, that's kind of the point, right? Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> to make this. Mm-hmm. So, okay, so. A question about that hard drive in the artist's garret. Um, one of the one of the sort of ethical values in the open source free software community, who are you know sort of adjacent and connected in so many ways here, is um, it's not just the final product that you want to preserve. Um, it's it's how you made it. Right, it's the blueprints. It's the source yeah. code. Yeah, um, and and you talked a little bit about the intent of the artist as yes. well. Also, data is that. So, <laughs> do you feel is that is there a way now of thinking? I've produced this artwork, but I'm also going to record my what got to it or is there a mystique to that that you means that you can't you shouldn't really get access to it so that's the practice of time-based media conservation and again there's a well-structured discipline around this there are masters and phd programs around this and I feel so yes we need Sorry. all of that we need all of that data we need to know everything we need to know as much as we can the environment of the computer the cultural landscape that you're in in the moment when you're creating this work all of the technology affordances and so So that comes together in something called an archival information package. And so that's what the Transfer Data Trust is. It consists of those archival information packages. And I think where we're really different from a lot of traditional conservation perspectives is that we see that as constantly evolving. We see that package as something you can recommit to as time evolves, as the work evolves, as culture evolves. Um, So that is really what the system is holding And we want lots of copies of that. Of course, it's encrypted and only certain people who have certain ownership or right access to it will receive all of it. But almost all the work that we represent at Transfer and have since the beginning is meant to be experienced by everyone in the public space of the internet. And that principle of openness is so important to what our curatorial vision has always been about and to 
what our artists are working with in the studio and thinking through in their practice. I'm fascinated by you saying, of course it's encrypted, right? Because yeah. doesn't that mean that you reintroduce some fragility into all of this? Because what happens is you encrypt it and now you have, you know, data that is just looks random if you don't have the key and you're, you know, how many copies of the key do you keep and who keeps, the keys who's the key keeper like yep. I, I i i as 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 i'm gleaning you know i feel like i'm going so have you ever thought about gravity <laughs> mr newton but but um uh you know there is a clearly a lot of you know the there is both a theoretical framework for this and then there's the sort of work that you have to do as you know a gallery owner and building these trusts of going yes this is very nice but like how many copies of the keys do I store, right? Um, do, I guess that my follow-up question then is, uh, uh, like, how comfortable are the artists with having all of their their process kind of store, demanded off them? I know that's not how it is, but, like, you know, there is a bit of a sense that, like, yeah, you have to give us everything. Um, is that a tension between people like the, 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 what you're doing and the artists that you're working with? Yes, 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 and yes on all of this. And these are the design challenges that we're working through right now as we start to build out these systems. And the big thing we're looking for in forms of support is – money to cover the labor of the artists leaning in to do all this work. Cause it's also a lot of work for them to get yeah. into their archives, to prepare these files, to learn about encryption, to have enough knowledge of the technology, to make informed decisions about how they intend for their work to be treated. So this is going to be a really nice dovetail into the curriculum in a moment. But I think what I want to first say <laughs> is that, uh, um, you know, the, these design challenges are something that we are approaching in a very different way because I'm very fortunate to have been working with a global cohort of artists for the last 10 years at Transfer. And so we have real world value exchange protocols that we have been doing as humans in the world without this technology. And so I think where a lot of these solutions are tech first, and I also work in the technology industry, I'm a user experience researcher, been working in decentralized spaces and softwares for a long time as well with right, that right. hat on. So I understand that the humans and the value have to come before the technology. And I think that's why we're really unique because we have that and we've tested it. And so now what we're looking at is how can we apply the tooling to these things, which we've already seen that work within our network of care, within our network of trust and exchange. Um, but yes, it's going to entail everyone getting their hands dirty. The artists are going to have to be able to deploy a node. We're going to have to get them comfortable with command line to some degree. We're going to have to do a lot of really nerdy stuff. And only and some of the artists are super nerds. Luckily, right, I'm, I'm right. very I mean, like about half space, of my roster. Right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. They're coders or developers, but not all of them. And so, how do we bring everyone along and get them up to a level of? Um, comfort and knowledge about the system so they can make the informed decisions about how their work is going to be treated for the long term. So how much of this stuff, the challenge of, of kind of bringing together these different disciplines, right? The tech, the art, the archivist, um, how much of that, and you have to specify in terms of percentages, um, is, is, um, education, right? Like no one taught me how to do this, right? No one taught me how to use the command line. How much of it is personality? I hate, you know, I don't, you know, I mm -hmm. hate getting, doing these kind of finickety things, or I really mm -hmm. love doing that. That's part of my art. Um, and how much of it is sort of cultural Yes. in the like, oh, again, I don't want to extract from this, but like when I was like, you know, a teenage hacker or whatever, we couldn't stand the net artists. Sorry. <laughs> um, and like in London, because they got like cool grants and they didn't know how to program properly. They were using Macromedia Flash or whatever. Oh, and boy. so there was a, there was a like cultural tension and we, you know, we crossed the streams yes. eventually. Like yes. we, we'd have these hilarious sort of mock fights and then make up. But, um, 
but 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 it, how, how to what degree do those things play in and how do you like you seem to have to be the peacemaker in the, a lot of that yeah and this is again my ux hat just maybe sort of adopted to a different role but right. um you know speak being able to speak engineering but also being able to go into an artist studio and have a very heady conceptual discussion and in their defense the net artists are subversively using those technologies in the wrong way for a reason oh, anyway, not, not to take a stand no, I, that's not that's not fine like you know peace in their time um but like the, the, um, i think it's yeah. all i think it's all Flash. personality. I have to say yeah. almost all, yeah. I would say 75%. And, um, the thing is archiving is a really lonely act. And so I want to create are all lonely acts, right? It, like really a are developing, artist, yeah. creating yeah. in the studio, archiving all of that. So I think it's about doing it together and creating a culture and a behavior around that. And a new kind of activity and encouragement and, I think these are the kinds of um, interface affordances we haven't fully seen emerge in the D-Web space. And yes. so this is the stuff that I'm really excited to bring to the space. And again, I have the people who've been building the behaviors and the intentions together. So how can we now build uh, interfaces and affordances around that? Right. So this is, you know, it's a classic problem of decentralized systems that we keep bumping ahead against. And, you know, usability, God, tell me about it, right? Like one of the things, <laughs> so one of the things that the foundation, um, so the Filecoin Foundation has to be somewhat selective about what we do. This is kind of a big discussion point in the Filecoin universe at the moment. Like what should the foundation do? Um, but one of the odd things that we do is we have a usability team. And one of the reasons why we have a usability team is because we sort of looked and went, okay, this is one of these things that classically decentralized systems fail at. And until we work out a solution, we're going to have to host one, right? Um, and, you know, the broader version of this, like when you were talking about, like, this is a social activity, my, like, geek computer science-y thing was going, yeah, like, the hard thing is the pipeline, right? Yeah. Like, the art industry, the art world has a pipeline, right? Mm -hmm. um, and pipelines are hard to build in a decentralized environment, yep. right? Um, and so it's so again, we'll, 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 oh God, we're getting so into it. We've got a few minutes. <laughs> left. Um, so the transfer data trust, if somebody wants to get involved in that, somebody wants to be part of that pipeline, whether they want to store data, they want to preserve, they, they have data that they want to preserve, or their artist going, I don't want this to go away, right? I'm aware that like, I, I did not sign up for ephemerality <laughs> when I did this. How do they get involved? Like, how do they form part, join part of that? So the way that I'm thinking about this is much more as a federated system. I do fully intend to make available and open everything we're building, but I am really interested in defining and encoding the values in this community of folks. So it's just to say, these are the, the, the artists that I'm working with that I'm starting with and the right. toolkits and the transactions and all of the UI and the protocols that we're developing, we're hoping to make available to other artists to pick up and form their own value networks. Because again, I don't, I think this myth of the the DAO as the fully autonomized for everyone, forever scaling to huge. I, I don't think that that's how real cultural value and human value even in our lives comes together. So um, to get involved, you can absolutely acquire a work from the trust. You can host a node uh, in your home as a member of the trust. Mm -hmm. You can also, um, if you're a technologist or a specialist, you can contribute into our give get systems. So there will be a lot of access points for people to contribute their knowledge and then get value out of the system in those ways. And then really as an artist, if you're, you know, coming along to these courses and starting to understand these tools and affordances, fork our repo, Get together with people that also care about the same things you do and please prop it up and talk to us about what you've learned and let's exchange. And I feel like enough of these trusts, federated trusts together could really spark a movement for a different way that artists think about the value of their work and their IP. 
So, um, and we'll throw links in to the the repo to fork uh, in the in the notes. Um, so, if people feel whether you're an artist or a technologist, when you cross over like this, one of the things that happens is you can get a little overwhelmed. It's like not so much imposter mm -hmm. syndrome as like, I am actually an imposter in this place, <laughs> right? Like I'm coming at it. Um, tell us a bit about the decentralized uh, web for creators course that you're working with, with gray area. Yeah, so Gray Area, for those of you who might not know, is a San Francisco-based foundation that is focused on art and technology. So all of the issues we've been talking through, they've also been at it for about 15 years, bringing together these very different types of creatives, um, producing shows, exhibitions, and running a really incredible education program. So this is the latest uh, offering from their education programming side, and the DWeb curriculum for creators is about reaching artists and maybe technologists who are D-Web curious, but who haven't yet delved too much into that area, uh, inviting those folks into courses which are a mix of conceptual uh, ideation and praxis. So real hands-on workshops, getting into things like command line literacy, deploying NAS drives as nodes in decentralized storage systems, looking at DAO tooling and how organizers and activists can start to take ownership of the infrastructures they're using for their work. And so we're really trying to invite folks who have a critical or theory or creative based approach into this ecosystem of the decentralized web. And the courses are all online. So we're going to run right now. We're in open enrollment period. You can find it on grayarea.org. And that runs up to when the courses start uh, in about a, a month or so in the spring. And then we're going to run our first session live online. And after that first iteration, we then as instructors are preparing all our materials in an online platform, which will be decentralized and spatial as well. A very cool collaborating entity is New Art City. That's newart.city. If you haven't seen their platform, please check that out. And so these courses will allow folks to come in after the live sessions to do topic-based exploration and dig into some of the toolkits and outcomes that came from the classes. So it's just to say, eventually the course will be open sourced, but in the first round, it's really about the non-lonely act of getting people together into right. virtual space to explore these topics. I know that when people look at this, um, there's sometimes a little bit of sticker shock because there's there's a cost attached to signing up the thing. And then if they're canny, they go, well, I'm a struggling artist. It'll be open source later. Um, I'll just pick up that stuff. And the few things that, that, that I've learned from this is, one, there is huge value in getting involved in that first cohort. Right. As you say, the non lonely part of it is incredibly important and you participate in a way that um, and you commit to it in a way that, that, that you, you, it's a little harder to do when you're just working with the materials like you, you know, the difference between auditing a course and actually doing the course. Exactly. Um, uh, the other thing which I understand why people don't shout from the the rooftops, but but you've been watching this for fifty minutes. You you can be in on this. Is that there are plenty of ways to get um, uh, uh, grants, particularly if you're from a, 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 a unrepresented, uh, underrepresented community, um, come and talk. Like there are there are there are often solutions. So don't be don't be entirely scared away by that. Um, the other thing, and like, let me describe how I think the audience is for this. Mm -hmm. And, and, and then you can tell me I'm wrong. Um, or, or say, no, it's for much more people. So a lot of conversations I have with artists is they've got to the point where they know, particularly if they went through the NFT boom, that there's a value to storing their stuff on IPFS, right? Mm -hmm. They, they, they know it's got to be decentralized, but they don't really know what that means. Yeah. And also they've been kind of burnt sort of with someone going, oh, yeah, I'll store it on IPFS. And then they either go away or, like, it's not clear who, or, you know, they start charging you. Um, 
So these are these are artists who are already somewhat engaged with this decentralized idea, but they they're like everybody else. They're just having to like use search engines and, and mess you around. Is that you got kind it? Of the and audience? this is so important. And this is something that I've talked a lot about in my practice. But I know all of the instructors that are coming together in this course really care about is that in that NFT space, you know, there were all these actors sort of claiming about openness and transparency and decentralized. And actually it was a lot of third party custodial platforms. And right. when you look at the infrastructure, All you start to AWS see or whatever. the yeah, same yeah. dependencies that are in these kind of existing systems. So that's why these conversations, these conceptual dives into not only what is this infrastructure, but what are the systems at stake? Uh, who are the power players? Who, se- who seeks to benefit from your art as a creator, right? And what are their motivations? And so we're going to be digging into all of these issues in this course. And to your point about needs, and if we look at the economy right now for creatives, it's an abysmal situation. And a lot of people are looking to upskill and shift their professional position also adjacent to their creative practice in the rise of AI. So what does that mean? Sorry. What does upscale their practice? What does that? I think that a lot of creatives also have, you know, gig work that they're doing to sustain their life. They're using their creative talents and skills to serve clients and customers. And we're seeing so much of these industries being reduced right now and let massive layoffs happening and There's, I think, a real interest in getting into new forms and new systems and new ways of building things. And so I think this course is a really good opportunity for people to start to shift their mindset around some of those creative skills they have and how they might upskill and act in these economies, which are in our near future, in a different kind of orientation, right? Uh, And that's so crucial. So we're not turning anyone away based on needs. Um, We do have, uh, of course course, diversity, equity, inclusion scholarships, but it's not only that. We talk a lot about as instructors, as we've been building this course, about equalizing power structures and how important it is to have different perspectives in these conversations. Because we instruct, but we're, we don't know the answers to these things all the time. This is about a conversation. Again, why these live courses and workshop courses are, are so important. Because a lot of the outcomes will be based on the workshopping and the participants and what they're contributing to. I mean, it's this, it's this weird thing of sort of like, you're like, like I said, you know, it's, it's often a strange place to be where you're working on the theory, but then you have to turn up and actually do the thing. (laughs) And, you know, here we are trying to teach people about how to, ascribe value to their art when the educational work that you're doing as well is like you're sitting there going, well, how do we, how do we get people to buy this? Like, how do we, or not, you know, how do we, how do we attach value to this experience, this thing that happens in time at the same time as producing materials that are open, that let people reproduce it and and spread it. Um, so, uh, uh, so th- those were kind of like the two the two things that we are sort of involved in and we're naturally excited to talk about. Um, you, you're a gallery owner. Um, uh, I know uh, in my notes I have like the Paris Art Museum Miami exhibition, um, and but I want to broaden it out. Like, what are you? Yeah. Like, what is happening in your in your yeah. uh, your your gallery art world thing? So Transfer just celebrated 10 years, and we started this process of a documentary film called Almost in Real Time. You can check that out on our website, transfer.art. It is a project that will forever be in the making. I feel like this film will will continue to change until the day that I leave this planet. Uh, But it's a sprawling effort. Um, And with that 10-year mark, we are making a distinct shift in our practice. And we are thinking about the gallery and sunsetting what it has 
has meant to be a gallery and taking inspiration from Exit to Community. So if you know this uh, project from the Med Lab in Boulder, they're looking Absolutely. at how um, startups or other entities can exit to community ownership. And so Transfer is doing an exit to community of the gallery world. And we hope to be a model and many other galleries will do this where we want to give ownership of the gallery to the artists. And so we're now in 2024, we're forming a nonprofit cooperative trust and much of that trust will be automated in these new governance models, which we talked about previously. Um, but this is a big shift in our practice, and it's a, a, a change in orientation to what we're doing. Um, so that's the big, I think, effort this year is establishing that entity and bringing the story into the world, hopefully to inspire again others to, to do similar, to redistribute wealth, all of these good things that are really crucial, I think, in this moment. Um, and so the transfer download at the PAM, the Perez Art Museum in Miami, is a really special exhibition. The download is a format that I've been developing um, since 2016. Also actually came from the Bay Area. Uh, it was born in the Bay and has traveled the world. It's been shown in Shanghai. It's been shown in Basel. It's been all over. Um, and it's another one of these sort of solidarity formats. And so what the transfer download is, it's a very physical format for exhibiting virtual art. And so it goes into a physical institution. I've, I've shown it at a lot of other museums, collecting institutions. I've also shown it at art fairs and other kinds of environments. It adapts to the architecture of the infrastructure. It creates a three screen layout, and then it has a hyperlink display, an iPad display, and the viewer can go in and switch between works and the entire room switches over. So it's sort of a hyperlinked salon style exhibition and it allows me to show video games, generative art. It allows me to show net art, virtual reality, virtual worlds, all in one sort of very impactful exhibition format. So this is something that runs on Touch Designer and um, it's really cool to have this opportunity to bring it to life within such a, a well-regarded institution. Um, and each time it's shown, there's a new curatorial selection. So for this, we've um, commissioned five artists from the PAM's purview, which is Latin and South America. Um, and so there's works which um, are featured from artists all over the world. It's 10 artists. And the curatorial is titled Sea Change. And it's about the sort of seismic shifts that we're experiencing, obviously, with catastrophic climate change, but also the acceleration of technology and how that's changing our daily lives. Um, the Perez Art Museum Miami is really in the middle of a lot of very interesting geopolitical cultural positions there in Miami. Um, it's next door neighbor um, used to yes. be the FTX arena. So Miami is no stranger to crypto and also the cultural it changes really isn't. there. No, right. And Pam is really uh, advanced as an institution in that their digital initiatives are really taking hold now. And so they have something called Pam TV. That's P A M M. TV, and you can go there and all of the works in this exhibition will be streaming online for free. Um, and you can see a single channel version on your computer. And then if you're able to make it to Miami, you can come step inside these worlds and check out the transfer download sea change. Wow. That was, that sounds amazing. And so, so, I mean, congratulations and uh, on, on the, 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 uh, the exit to community sort of plan again, you know, uh, we're sort of, there's a huge chunk of the Falcon community that is doing kind of similar things, right. For those of you who keep track of this sort of gossip, um, IPFS and LibP2P, um, that sort of more, uh, um, open source decentralized parts of it are all moving over and we're trying to work out how to set up trusts and, and nonprofits to do that. Um, there's been a big period, I think, as is true of a lot of decentralized projects where they kind of um, organized around capital and tokens and things like that. And now there's sort of a move back. Um, it's a very 
it's a very exciting, this is always the most exciting part, right? Like it's always the bit where you go, I have no idea what's going to happen now. Um, but I'm really excited and I hope we can, we can have, uh, you or, or any other, uh, member of the, of the transfer folks, um, in that community to come back and, and, and report back on, on how, how things are going. Um, so thanks very much for coming on. Yeah, it was, this is great. Claudia, and, um, and, and good luck. Great. And uh, click on those links. Um, and if you're in Miami, visit the exhibit. When is it, it happening? It's February 15th, and it's through the summer, through August. Oh, fantastic. So by the time you you see this, I'm, I'm pretty sure it will be open or you can start traveling down to Miami. Um, and uh, if you are in the uh, Bay Area, uh, please check out um, the uh, Decentralized Web for Creators uh, course. And as I say, if you don't think you can afford it, go and talk to them. You may well be surprised. Um, and, uh, and check out transfer and uh and all of the work that this uh amazing institution is now doing after a, a decade of exploring the art in the decentralized world um thanks again clanny and uh see you all soon